The lead up to signing day is always eventful, and for Nebraska, it's been a wild week. This staff's only been in Lincoln for one year, but they made sure to fill in their roster with freak athletes who can play multiple positions, and in Matt Rule's words, players I believe can play in the NFL. I've always looked at signing day as a competition between the haves and the have-nots. The schools with the best facilities, the most money, the big name coaches and championship potential versus a bunch of average college football programs. And make no mistake, Nebraska fell down to that have-not tier. But with their new facilities, a strong NIL collective and a big boy coaching staff, they're fighting their way back into that top tier conversation. So today, we'll look at where this class ranks in the Big Ten. I'll let you know who I think some of the most important recruits are, what positions they still need to add, and I'll give you my thoughts about Chubba Purdy hitting the transfer portal and what it means for the offense. But let's start with where this class ranks nationally because it's not easy to recruit against winning teams when you haven't made a bowl game in seven years. And that was the first thing I noticed when I checked the national rankings. There are only three teams that missed a bowl game ranked in the top 25. Florida, obviously, South Carolina because Beamer's a great recruiter and they're in the SEC and then Matt Rule's team. But why Nebraska? How do they keep pulling so much talent? We know the obvious answers like resources and fan base, but look at the in-state talent. Rule mentioned in his presser that there are 11 or 12 Nebraska high school kids who can play Power 5 football, but he can only take the best ones. And for the second year in a row, there's been a top 60 player in the class coming from a high school in-state. The players in Nebraska are getting better, so even though the football team's been bad, they still do well recruiting locally and it helps to boost their class ranking. Now, this is just one thing I noticed, and there are plenty of reasons why Rule was able to pull together such a solid group, but it's important that the high schools keep putting out good players because they're going to be the backbone for years to come. In the Big Ten, even with Oregon, Washington, SC, and UCLA joining, they still finished sixth right behind USC, who has way more talent around their campus and who had a Heisman winner in the last two years. Think about how impressive that is. Nebraska's recruiting almost as well as one of the most relevant schools in college football, and they still haven't proved anything. Wisconsin and Iowa, once again, couldn't land a better class. And shocker, Washington, who made the playoff, barely made the top 10. It's still early in the rule era, but everything's on track to getting back to where they need it to be. We'll talk more about the positives in a second, but there was one negative. One loss that hurts this offense and isn't going to help Dylan's development. Chubba Purdy, who I expected to start at least the first few games next year, entered the portal a few hours after Matt Rule raved about the QBs coming back and obviously included Purdy in that conversation. And I don't want to act like I was surprised because I've heard from people who know that family and they said all along that the odds were slim he was going to stay. But just because I wasn't surprised doesn't mean I expected it. The starting job was there for the taking. Yeah. Raiola is the future, but Chuba could have been the transition guy. He had the advantage already. He's played with these receivers longer. He knows the playbook better. He's been working out as a college QB for three years now and played in multiple Big Ten games. The job was his to lose, and I just didn't expect beta energy from him. The problem for Nebraska is they're working with a very limited room right now. Assume Dylan's the starter, but what? Kalen or Harburg ends up the number two? Harburg's a completely different type of QB than Dylan, which means the packages and plays are different depending on who's in the game. Competition drives excellence, and if Dylan walks into an empty room and gets handed the job, he's competing against himself and doesn't get pushed as hard as some of the other guys in the Big Ten who are fighting for their job every day. Without an experienced vet, there's no one to show him the ropes. There's no real leadership. It's all new. It's starting from scratch. Yeah, it'll work out, but it's going to be a rougher journey than if they had an experienced leader in that room. For a week now, everyone's been talking online about Casey Thompson being in Lincoln and how they'd love to see him back with the team. But until tonight, I said it would never happen. Why would he jump into a full room just to be a backup? But then he posted this on Instagram, and if you don't recognize it, this purpose definition is the exact same screenshot that Dylan posted right before he announced he was flipping from Georgia. 
Now, I still don't think he'll play for the team, but he posted again an hour later, and the cryptic posts have some meaning. Maybe he's coming back to be a GA, or he'll have some analyst role. I don't know. It's all speculation, but how great would it be to see him back at Nebraska, leading the QB room until it was time for Dylan to take over? You want to talk about purpose? Imagine how good it'd feel to be the guy who led this team when they needed it the most and stood by a future superstar side throughout camp to help him prepare for an insanely bright future. Future. You can find purpose in many things, but I'd say being Nebraska's quarterback in a time of need ranks up there pretty high. I mentioned on Twitter that I donated to the 1890 Collective this week, and to be honest, I felt obligated to. I've asked for Nebraska to spend on big name players, and I hope they pay up to keep these guys out of the portal. And this month, we saw it was successful. I was introduced to another NIL site today called HuskerLockerRoom.com. They set up autograph signings and appearances for players to give them another way to be compensated. And I love it because I've always collected memorabilia, but now there's a way to make sure that what I'm buying actually supports the guys who are signing the stuff. So tonight, I bought two cards off the site. I found a Heinrich Harburg autograph on there for only $35. And then since volleyball had such a good year, I picked up a Harper Murray autograph card for $70. Everything you order gets shipped out the same day. Their team goes out and gets the product signed directly by the players and everything you purchase comes with a certificate of authenticity. It's a streamlined process to get players paid for their signatures instead of autograph guys who hound those dudes down outside hotel rooms or wherever else. And the code they gave me for free shipping is corn crazed. So if you ever want to pick anything up on the site, make sure you add that in before you check out. Coming off an NIL conversation, we got to talk about Dylan and all the comments I saw leading up to signing day. I think it was kind of unfair to put any peer recruiting expectations on him this late in the game because there's no way he was going to pull a Ryan Wingo or a Brandon Baker from Texas and anybody else he was cool with during this recruiting process pretty much already had their mind made up. And I saw that Jordan Seaton, the number one tackle in the country who opted not to sign with Colorado today, said that Dylan's reached out, which means he's still trying to use his name to his advantage right now but even if they don't land anybody from high school this cycle i still think they end up with one or two guys out of the portal come january where dylan really wins in recruiting is next year if he plays well as a true freshman and shows he's a future star in the big 10 there will be a lot of guys who want to get in that room with him since he'll be a sophomore with at least two more seasons to make a championship run but I don't want to ignore the guys they did pull in. Carter Nelson, the number one player in Nebraska and a top five tight end in the country. Grant Bricks, the number one player in Iowa and the number three tackle. And Preston Taumua, the number one player in Hawaii and a top 20 lineman. And those are just the headliners. This class runs deep. Four-star corner Mario Buford was the highest rated recruit on the fifth best high school team in the nation. Davon Hall is a 6'2 receiver who's going to be one of the fastest guys in the room from day one. And he had offers from Penn State, Tennessee, and Ole Miss. We talk about needing receivers ASAP. And he's a guy who's got the size and the speed to play right away. Linebacker Vincent Shavers, who was committed to Miami up until he signed his NLI, was a huge pickup since he's the only true middle linebacker in this class, and we just found out Dylan Rogers is done with football. They're building for the future. They're adding guys who can play all over the field and make this team a matchup nightmare. Rule said he looked for positionless players, guys who've played both ways and can do the same thing in college to add a wrinkle once in a while. Their vision's great, and seeing how well their freshmen played this season, I don't think any of us are going to argue that they're on the right path in terms of recruiting. But what about now? If they want to win in 2024, is there enough talent to get it done? I think we all agree the defense is set. They're returning pretty much everybody, and the depth's already solid. It's the other side of the ball that's still questionable. If Dylan starts, I think I'll expect eight wins out of this team, because all it took this year was limiting the stupid turnovers. But is eight Eight low for a defense this strong and a schedule this average? I'd say so. I think they got to go big. Recruit to win now. Recruit to win 10 games. Recruit to make the playoff. It's not going to happen with true freshmen starting, but they picked up solid depth pieces. The running back rooms got both Gabe Irvin and Ramir back, and Emmett Johnson played well enough down the stretch. But can they add that Oregon running back or somebody else who doesn't have the injury history just in case shit goes left? Jalen Lloyd, Malachi Coleman, and Alex Bullock are all going to be better in their second year starting, but there's no number one right now. 
Can they pull a miracle and get Julian Fleming or Evan Stewart? Or is there someone else entering later that can be that big body target this team's desperate for? I love the direction they're going and I see the vision for the future. I just know they're a few inches away from being a really good team. A top 25 team who beats USC or Iowa on the road. January will tell us a lot. It'll tell us if we're talking about seven wins or 10. It'll tell us if we should hope for a bowl appearance or a playoff berth. Fantasyland scenario, Casey Thompson comes back to play QB and shows Dylan the ropes. Evan Stewart jumps on board after pulling in 91 catches for 1,200 yards at Texas A&M the last two years. And whoever the new QB coach is gets Kalen and Harburg ready to go just in case they have to play. Best case, one of those three comes true. And if not, there's still a reason to believe that this team will be better than the last. I watched Adam Carricker's video where he covered signing day from a totally different perspective than I did, and he went into detail about legacy players, the in-state pickups, and potential diamonds in the rough. So if you haven't had a chance to check his video out yet, you can head to CarricerChronicles.com to find that one and everything else he's made this past week, or you can hit the description box below where I linked it for you right next to his YouTube channel. But I want to know what you think, so let me know in the comments below. Were you surprised that Nebraska loaded up on high school guys and stayed away from the portal, or did you see that coming? Other than Dylan, which signee are you most excited to see? And now that they've landed their first five-star recruit in over 15 years, how long will it take to pick up another? I'll tell you what, if QB1 comes out on fire and leads this team to a big year on offense, I could see a five-star receiver coming in next year. And if that were to happen, I don't know if any of us would know how to act. But that's all I've got for today. So until next time, thank you for being here and I will see you in the next one. Go Big Red.